Hello everyone, welcome to the Dutch Game Day, uh, hosted by Dutch Games Association and uh, run by, um, by Alessandra van Oslo, who made a beautiful program for us today. Um, we have the first speaker of the day for this uh, location, which is Bertine van Hovel, and I'm briefly going to introduce her. Uh, I met Bertine for the first time about uh, almost 10 years ago at the game exhibition in Tilburg, of all places, and uh, where she passionately talked about video games and games, and where we bonded over this game uh, relation. Um, and since then we've hung out in different places around Europe, actually, uh, that was all about games. We even met each other at randomly at uh, London, um, what was it, London train somewhere, oh, <laughs> when yeah, we came back yeah. from uh, different... Uh, game exhibitions and events. Um, Bettina is very passionate about many aspects about uh, in game development and the game industry. Uh, she has been running LARPs, also for projects that I've been doing, and she uh, is also very passionate about helping other people. And one of those things is then now also being part of the uh, Dutch Games Association board. So this is uh, very amazing. Uh, today she's going to talk about another thing that she does, which is uh, narrative um, design. And so she's going to talk about expanding at East Wake through the power of modular narrative, so take the floor. Yes, fantastic. For the team. <laughs> All right, yeah, so expanding at East Wake through the power of modular narrative, or rather, what I prefer to talk about, why at East Wake was both the best and the worst case. I just did a black, fantastic, yes, wonderful. Somebody gave me buttons, this was a bad idea. <laughs> Um, so, I'm going to be uh, talking a little bit about uh, what modular design is, uh, what uh, at Eve's Wake is, um, also how things didn't exactly go as planned, and also a little bit about some of the tools that we've been using for this. Um, also, as I write it, told you, I'm, hi, I'm Bertine. <coughs> So, typically in serial design, uh, whenever you do serial narrative design, oh, I, great, all the fonts went wrong, wonderful. Anyway, so what you typically have in serial design is, is that you have, uh, whenever you want to introduce your dark and gritty Red Riding Hood retelling, uh, you may first have a fight with the wolf, then uh, with the hunter, and then of course your grandma, when, until you get to the next plot beat. And what modular design does is that if you think that one of these things doesn't exactly take place at the right moment, or you want to run these things parallel, you run them parallel. So as a choice, as a player, you have the choice to go either fight the wolf, the hunter, the grandma, or maybe Snow White, if you have time to implement Snow White. Incidentally, have you noticed that Snow White is always displayed with the apple in her hand, which is um, just a little bit disturbing, but okay, Disney. Now, you can make this very complicated. Um, you can either do more branching within it, or you can add a condition, whatever sort of thing is going to be suitable for your story. So that's kind of like what modular design is in a nutshell. It's great for replay. Players really have the feeling that they can choose which path they want to go into. Um, it's really good if you want to have a nice chunky game, uh, one of the problems that you always find within serial design is that you don't get enough time to either explore the world or explore the characters, and because replayability becomes an important thing, you can add a little bit more details in either of the modules, the narrative modules that you're presenting to the player. Writers can work in parallel, which is also fun, because it means that um, if you have a, well, a start and a plot beat you want to work towards, but you're not quite sure how you want to go there, how you want to tackle it, and you're working with a different writer, then both of you can write two separate modules about what the middle path is going to be. It's also a really fun challenge to do. And uh, essentially, the branching dialogue. So, um, so well, yeah, what's, um, what's not to love? So, let me briefly tell you about At Deep's Wake before I'm going to be telling you about how we utilize modular design within that game. Um, it's a Lovecraftian horror visual novel created by Bob Lemmix. Uh, I knew Bob, I think, from LARP. Oh my god, I know everybody from LARP. Um, and he approached me because he knew that I was a professional writer and he told me, I have a really cool idea that came to me in a dream. And initially I was like, oh god. Uh, but then he told me the pitch, was a, which was actually pretty damn fun. Um, 
The game takes place uh, during a family reunion in a large castle somewhere in the middle of North Brabant uh, over the span of five days. And it turns out that you and 11 other contestants are competing for the greatest power ever to be bestowed upon mankind. Because this is a Lovecraftian tale, this power might be evil, maybe a question mark? Make allies, kill your competition, and as a good story pertains. And because this is a vision novel, of course, we're going to have one romanceable character. Yes, exactly, yeah. <laughs> eh, too many clicks. Yes, okay, so. You don't need to read any of these. This is just an example, fortunately. Please don't try to zoom in, because there is nothing. Um, but yeah, when uh, Bob and I started putting together all of the scenes that we wanted to have within that East Wake, um, we decided to, first of all, subdivide the day itself into five, five different parts. Yeah, so morning, noon, afternoon, evening and night, I think. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, and when we knew which scenes we were going to be, so which locations we were going to be doing, um, I took all the characters together that we had designed, and I was going to mix and match, seeing which characters would be where at what particular time, for the most maximum dramatic effect, because that's why you do writing. When I was satisfied with all of the places where all these characters were going to be, I started doing a rough scene description of what these characters might be doing eventually. Not all of the scenes that you see here on paper came, got into the game itself, because afterwards we also started evaluating, okay, so which scenes, which modules could we use for the final game, which ones were going to be the best way to tell this particular story, and which ones were also going to be fun for the player to experience. The eventual scene composition became like this, so this is day one, which is a little bit different than the other two days. Um, this is the time of this scene, and the blue boxes are basically all of the scenes that are taking place. There's also a day five, but I'm not going to show that to you because it's a real chaos thing, so don't. Um, so yeah, so in theory, adding more stuff to this game should be possible. Right? It's, it's, we've designed it in a way that we can add and subtract scenes in a really easy way. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, making a definitive edition was actually very hard. And the reason why it was harder than we initially anticipated is I need to actually tell you what Elise Rig really is. It is uh, David Lynch means Lovecraft means North Brabant, and if there are people in uh, the audience who don't know what no North Brabant is, uh, it might be the best province in the Netherlands. Uh, you can quote him on that. <laughs> wow, holy shit, a lot of North Brabant. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, every contestant can die. Not at every moment in the game, but at but every single contestant can die, meaning that if they are dead, then every single scene that comes afterwards needs to take into account that that character may be alive or might be dead. So you can already imagine, like, wow, that's going to be complicated. And yes, that became complicated, but it, become, it gets worse. Um, your own death is also not going to be the end. So sometimes, um, well, so when Bob and I were talking about, like, okay, well, it's Lovecraft, so there should be a little bit more thrilling in there, maybe there might be bad endings, and we're like, well, actually, it wouldn't be fun to end a visual novel somewhere. So there are ways for you to deal with your death. Um, you may also be able to reload your game, and then what you learn during the game can significantly alter subsequent playthroughs. So again, something can happen at the start of the game that can influence the rest of the scenes, every single scene that has been written afterwards, um, in ways that significantly alters the story. Also, some characters know that you've been using knowledge from different playthroughs, because it's that was our interpretation of like how are we introducing really kind of like Lovecraftian ideas of design into game design itself. We thought, well, it would be fun if some characters are just going to be remarking like, "Hey, did you did you just reload the game while we were in this conversation?" To give one example of uh, one of the significance is that if you have played the game, um, or if you don't, there might be spoilers also, uh, there is a moment at the start of the game where you're being guided to your, your guest room, 
and it turns out that somebody got murdered in your guest room. It just happens. Now, don't worry, this guy, not a nice guy, N nobody likes him, so you can just leave him dead. But if you really want to, you can just go back to the start of the game, you can either reload it or you can restart the game, and then you get to use the knowledge of the fact that this guy got murdered in order to save this guy. Which, again, significantly alters the story in ways that we probably shouldn't have done. Um, so yeah, instead of um, this thing, where you go from you know three scenes, go into two scenes, etc., etc., nice, organized, no problems, it was more like this. Uh, oh yeah, I call this the uh, spaghetti lemon skates. I uh, hope you like it. Delicious. So when we came to how to design the definitive edition, we were at first playing with adding more scenes to it, but then we realized that every single scene that we were going to add would also have to take into account every single alteration that would lead up to that specific scene. And that scene would also influence all of the other scenes. So every single scene we would be adding would be just adding a significantly larger workload. Instead, we opted to have more choices of the player be reflected in the storyline and being reflected in the choices, because we were thinking, well, the scenes themselves were already pretty well picked, um, but it was going to be much easier in order to just add more details rather than to add more scenes. Also, it turns out that if you are offering people to cho choose very significant differences throughout all of these storylines, you're going to be introducing a lot of bugs that you didn't really take into account um, because there are a lot of mutations between all of these different things. And most of the problems that we encountered were going to be like logical bugs, so we had to go and fix those too. The other problem is, is that the whole thing that I told you about, you know, replaying the game, all those the storylines significantly, yeah, we didn't really communicate that to our players. So a lot of people had been replaying this game, or rather hadn't been replaying this game. And so they were like, okay, well, is this is this all of it? This is just a three hour game. It's like, no, please, there's more. There's even a definitive ending. Um, so we had to communicate that better. Uh, yeah, though, did we had some reviews that were very positive. Um, we also had some reviews. So it turns out that if you make a game based on Lovecraft's work, it attracts a certain type of player who has very specific opinions about the minority people you might be having in your game. Uh, yeah, I was not prepared for that, but unfortunately it does occur, and just to ignore those people. <laughs> Do watch streams. It was a lot of fun to see how people were actually interacting with this particular game, which choices they were making, why they were making these choices, and that really significantly increased, I mean, kind of like, um, yeah, they make it chunky part of the thing. And we extended the ending significantly. Uh, because this is the um, the first ending of the end scene. Uh, it does reflect choices. This is actually not the scene that we shipped it with. The island scene was a little bit more complicated, but this was one I could still find. Um, so it does reflect choices. Uh, but it was not really as comprehensive as we really wanted it to be. So we changed it into this. <sighs> yeah, uh, it was worth it. Let me put it like this, it was worth it, but it was a lot of work. Now, um, I did promise some tools, con some tools that consent, uh, con consent. Yeah, I had to ask consent to my tools. <laughs> um, as you can see, this is kind of like a, like a lot of flow diagrammy things, a lot of things going from one thing to the other. Um, when we started putting together how to make this, um, this game, I told Bob to really make sure that the content and the engine was going to be separate, because that means that you can work on uh, the content part of the game and the engine part of the game separately without having to influence each other. It also means that you can very much, very easily load your content into your game while you want to play test without, without having to rebuild the game or without having to run it in engine itself. Uh, so my recommendation is always to put either script writing or progression logic into a separate file, um, have a parser within the engine that can interpret it in one way or the other. You will save yourself a lot of work, you will save yourself a lot of headaches. The program we use for this specific thing is a program called YET, or Wyatt. 
It's a really nifty flow diagram program, um, and it outputs into an open uh, format called GraphML, which is basically an XML format. That itself, uh, I wrote a script to translate the XML format into, so into a CSV that then Unreal Engine, in this particular case, could interpret and could implement into, um, well, into a deep wake. Um, you can also do a very similar thing for JSON if you're working with Godot uh, or any other sort of file format that would be nice, but um, just a very easy database file format like a CSV or a JSON was going to be, was, is yeah, it's, it just, it's nice. It's nice. I'm not really sure what else I'm going to say about that. Um, yeah, so what is important is that if you're going to be doing something like that, is that nobody touches the CSV itself, any of the outputs, you should not, not be ha manually handling this. In the initial version, we had um, that it would only output about 80% of what had to go in the engine, and then afterwards we had to add some more things, but that turned out to be just introducing more bugs and introducing more hassles, so eventually I put some effort into making it 100% decidable in Wyatt. Um, and the other reason why we went with Wyatt itself is because it already had a good UI and UX design, which meant that, for example, some of our other team members who were going to be using, um, who were going to make content for this, didn't have to be retrained in some sort of like obscure standard or something. They could just simply use the program the way that it was designed. If you are asking yourself, like, wow, Bertin, um, that is a lot of effort. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do this. Um, this script itself, I did, I did write a, a couple of years ago. But anyway, so this script itself uh, was one of the very first things I programmed. Um, so it is kind of imaginable if you're currently only a writer or just only a narrative designer. Or you can ask your tool set programmers to help you out with that. Every tool set um, has limitations. I've used a lot of other ways of implementing narrative work into games, but your own designed ones is going to have the least issues. It's going to be more the most bespoke for the project that you're making. So yeah, in short, um, investing time in tools is really worth it. What your narrative design is really great. It works really well for other types of projects, but not for this particular project. Um, yeah, Lovecraft Team theme, it's wonderful to work with, uh, but um, because of implications, it can go into directions that you may not want to be associated with, so be careful for that. Lovecraft Team design, please don't, unless you have a bigger budget, or you have more writers, or you are really, yeah, you're really into masochism. Um, oh yeah, it's really cool to also put out a definitive edition for your work. Um, just to kind of like uh, be reintroduced to your own work in a more fresh manner and to re-explore the things that you've been working with, the which themes that you've been working with, and then also express those themes um, more chunky <laughs> in uh, the game. It's, just, it's, a, it's a good experience and I really recommend it to everybody. Thanks to my wonderful teammates at, at Eves Wake, so yeah, Bob who put everything together. Um, Gaia, wonderful co-writer. Uh, Sally Maricela's work is absolutely fantastic. Kaz, wonderful editor, really saved my skin in a few cases where I was not aware that if you combine Lovecraft with certain terms that it gets to be very icky very quickly. Uh, and Nikolai, Nikolai is a wonderful musician. Please look up his work, I really recommend it. And finally, thank you. Thank you so much, Bettina. We have time for one question, so make it a good one, <laughs> if any. Okay, I will throw it to you. Is this, is this a microphone? Yeah, that's a microphone. It is. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was uh, with, uh, when you were starting out the project, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, were you considering like other approaches to the like the design of uh, the narrative and like how to employ the modules or deliver them and uh, to the player. Uh, and if you did, like why did you discard other options? 
Um, so what we mostly decided was that we wanted to give players the ability to have multiple playthroughs, which for which mo modules were going to be great in that particular case. Um, initially, I was thinking about maybe having them more tightly fit together, uh, but it just turned out that throughout the design process, this was the most manageable with the small team and the small budget that we had. Thank you. Amazing. Well, that was the last and final question. You, uh, <laughs> Bettina will still be around, so yes, you yes. can um. uh, uh, ask her questions while around. Uh, um, in five more minutes, we will have the next talk by Ali. Um, so please welcome here, or you can go to the other st stage. Um, thank you so much, and see you.